Hi, my name is James O'Neill. Doing this video from Cornwall, United Kingdom. I'm going to call this video Kim Hughes GC, George Cross, painting the sand. Afghanistan, was it worth it? Slowly but surely, the news is starting to come through. But you know, get through this COVID. It's like this COVID. It's a brick wall. This pandemic. Uh, lockdown, all this. It's like a brick wall that's blocking out the news across the world. News that's relevant. News that we should know. And the Americans have pulled out of uh, Bagram Air Base. And they fucking sneaked out. But first, I'm going to talk about Kim Hughes. Let's give him the start of the video. And let's, let's show some respect. And if you can, maybe get the book. I finished this two weeks ago. I, read, I finished reading this two weeks ago. And so it's Kim Hughes, GC, Painting the Sand. That's the name of the book. And it's written by, well, it's written by Kim himself. Uh, probably with it, maybe with the help of somebody. But it's his story about when he was in Afghanistan in 2009. Kim Hughes, GC, is the most highly decorated bomb disposal operator serving in the British Army. He was awarded the George Cross in 2009 following a grueling six-month tour of duty in Afghanistan. It's only there six months. During which he diffused 119 improvised explosive devices, survived numerous, survived numerous Taliban ambushes and endured a close encounter with the Secretary of State for Defence. So... The reason why it's called painting the sand is bomb disposal, they have to crawl up to a bomb. Where the bomb's located, the detector, little flags put nearby. And then he has to crawl in and he has to scrape the dirt off and he has a paintbrush. And that's his main thing, paintbrush in the top of his flak jacket. And he brushes all around the bombs and these improvised explosive devices. He has to defuse them. Well, if it just happens that it goes off and he's on top of it like that, it's basically painting the sand because the sand is just covered in a spray of blood. It's like getting a fucking water pistol, you know, or a water gun and just spraying the sand, painting the sand. And that's what it is. That's what it is. it's like dark humor. And there was one period in two days where he diffused 40 improvised explosive devices over two days he was sent to the danes and they thought there was like a 10 or 12 of them and it turned out there was 40 because where the danes had their forward operating base they had to guard this road there was a blind spot and they were the taliban were putting improvised explosive devices there. so the danes got in touch said right we found a couple anyway when they sorted it out proper there was 40 of them and he was actually being shot at while he was diffusing him at points. So he's laying on the ground and these shots from the Taliban trying to kill him. He thought a lot of the Danes, and I don't know too much about the Danes, and uh, I'm going to maybe look into it. There's a film on me, Fire Stick, what I only found the other day. I can't see the subtitles. I don't speak Danish. So I'm going to do something about that and uh, look into him because he's he's very he praises them and he, he never really got to know about the Danes in Denmark. They had various operating bases, Taliban uh, forward operating bases, but the Americans don't know the Danes had forward operating bases and they were fighting. They were fighting proper, the Taliban, just like the Americans, just like the British. He also talks about when he had to uh, go defuse bombs that the Estonians found. Because they had a forward operating base. So if you can, get that book, Painting the Sand, Kim Hughes. So like I say, over a two-day period, he defused 40 improvised explosive devices, just one after the other. Oh, he was like a big group of them. Because the idea is, you think you've got them, and then one goes off. You think you've got them all. 
So, I'm going to start about what I was for. I was watching Parliament before. Boris Johnson's made a statement about Afghanistan because America's just like walks out of Bagram Air Base. He sneaks out in the middle of the night. They're denying it, but they did. They've got all, they've got personnel on Bagram Air Base. They've got all the equipment. They've got building equipment, road moving equipment. It's a huge, gigantic base. But they've also got Afghans there. And they've been sharing it with the Afghans as they've, as they've been scaling down. As all like the Afghans are going to be put in charge of it. Anyway, the Afghans woke up one morning and the Americans had all disappeared. They'd gone. And what they'd done was he'd left all the equipment. So if you imagine, because they didn't want the Afghans to see him dismantling computers and like packing everything up onto planes. They said they've got a program for later in the year. But they sneaked out early because they didn't want any shenanigans going on. So the Afghans woke up, the commander of the base, the Afghan commander, he's woke up, there's nobody there. When I say nobody there, there's only Afghans. The Americans have sneaked away. So this has been going on since 2001. So was it worth it? What was the point? What was the point of the war in Afghanistan? And here I'm going to tell you, I'm going to put links to my blog, radio shows, what I started in 2007. And I went right through to 2000, so I'm going to put a link to them all. But you go look at them, especially the later ones, the, the early ones. You can't see video links because they had a different format. And the format's changed, whereby I can't get them anymore. You can see them. You can go to my shows and then see all my individual shows. And in there, and what you'll do is you'll see them where I'm, You'll see when I'm doing videos about Afghanistan, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Hundreds of videos. And I was looking at, I went looking through the blog radio shows before. And then I went looking through videos that I talked about then. And I gave links to. And it was a bit upsetting. Because back then I was saying. It's all for nothing. But you've also got to remember who I am, the individual. James O'Neill, the individual, the I am. In 2000, October, October 2000, God sent me to the Church Universal and Triumphant in Montana. Big, huge church on a ranch called Springs, Montana. Church Universal and Triumphant. And I didn't know what was there. I knew it was there for something, but I didn't know what. I had all sorts of ideas. And then on third day, like, which was my birthday, the 7th of October, something happened in the hall. God, all of a sudden, God just said to me, God said to me, this energy fucking surrounded me. I was in this hall with about 1,500 to 2,000 Americans from this church. It's like an old aircraft hangar. And all of a sudden, God said to me, that's why you're here. Tell them to stay out of politics. And that was the 7th of October, 2000. It was my birthday. And I was like, fucking hell, what the fuck am I going to do? How am I going to tell these Americans? That night, I went home and I tried to write a letter. I wrote a letter. Well, I did write a letter. And then something happened with CNN, because that's why I remember it's this day. Anyway, I told the Americans told him that day and I told him the next day and I tried to tell him they wouldn't have it and I said God has told me to tell you to stay out of politics because they were going to vote for George Bush in his first election in four weeks time in four weeks time four weeks after I told him George Bush was having his first election and this church was organising to politically support George Bush and it was it actually was telling its people to vote for George Bush. That's what happened when I was in this hall. This woman on stage, she, she actually said, her words were, she said, as you know, it's election year, and the election is in a few weeks' time. And as you know, we cannot tell you who to vote for because we've only just got our charity status back, what Bill Clinton took off us. 
You see, because churches have a charity status, but part of the condition of that charity status is they don't get involved in politics. Well, Bin, Bill Clinton took the charity status off him because they were involved with the Republican Party and they were supporting the Republican Party prior to Bush's election when Bill Clinton was president. So they lost that charity status. So they had to pay tax as though they were a business. So they just got the charity status back, which meant they were now a tax-free organisation. And that's what they were concerned about, keeping that tax-free status. It was about money. So they didn't like, say, vote George Bush, do this and that. She said, as you know, we're not allowed to tell you to vote for us. We've just got our charity status back. She said, and this is the important bit. And as she said that, this energy surrounded me, and I thought, here it is why I'm here. And she said the words, there is only one party that is against abortion. So she just told him to vote for George Bush. And that's when God said to me, that's why you're here. Tell them to stay out of politics. And I just fucking shriveled up and died. Fellas all died. Because I've now got to go against the energy of these people. These Americans, I've got, I have to go as an individual against the energy of this church as an individual, it's a powerful church. So that was October the 7th, 2000. October the 7th, 2001, America started bombing Afghanistan and the first troops went over the border. From Tajikistan and the invasion had started and George Bush came on TV and gave a, a dec gave a TV address to the nation one year later my birthday again and George Bush came and he said I am here to announce that we have started uh, operations against Afghanistan and our planes have started bombing and our troops are moving in and we are now committed to a war to get Osama bin Laden because 9-11 hadn't happened yet see 9-11 happened 11 months after I was at the church universal in triumphant but one year to the day after I told them after God told me to tell them and I told them George Bush invaded Afghanistan and here we are now what? July the 5th, the 6th, the Americans are sneaking out of Bagram Air Base, and I'm going to give you some videos to show you. The Afghans are like that. The Afghan commander's like that. He said, I never knew. You never told me. And yet, President uh, Biden's spokespeople, you know, his press secretary saying that, they say, Oh, yeah, they knew. They didn't. They sneaked out in the night, left all their equipment, left the cots. They're just like, wandered around and then slowly strolled towards aeroplanes hoping nobody'd notice them and then one by one they disappeared they turned out the lights in the tent as though they were asleep they might have even put bundles under the fucking blankets you know like you do you see in the comedy films where somebody puts a bundle in the fucking melon as though it's an head they might have done that that's how low it might have been and that was just a couple of days ago and the Afghanis, the Taliban, are already fucking taking towns. And the news are onto it. But they're not really bullying it up yet because the government, our government has had to make a statement. And it's like, it's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be a fucking bloodbath. So Boris Johnson came on before to give a statement about Afghanistan. Well, I think this fucking bloke should be giving a statement. And he should be asking the question, was it worth it? Or my mates who died. On his very first mission to defuse a bomb, he was flown out to an operation with the uh, Welsh Guards, I think. We were on a big operation. He'd found a bomb. And when he got there, like, some officer said to him, well, we don't need you. What are you doing here? No, 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 no. And some, like, rank fucking horrible officer. He met some great officers. 
But this on his very first operation in Afghanistan, he's nervous. He's like he's not done it before. He doesn't know the routine yet. He knows how to defuse bombs on paper. But he's never done one. Anyway, next thing you know, is it turns out this officer comes back to him. He says, "What are you doing it? You should be over there, five hundred yards away." He said, "No, this is where we should be." Well, your orders are different now, so get over there to that compound, five hundred yards away. So it's across open ground. So he said to this officer, "Well, how do we get across there?" He said, "Walk across." Well, one, you could have IEDs, but it's a slow process getting across 500 yards of open ground. You can hear shots being fired all round because there's an operation going on. And he said, well, shouldn't we have some defence? And he went, well, you've got guns, haven't you? So the bomb disposal had to make the way 500 yards over to this compound. And then they were told, yeah, we think this might be a bomb operator, so can you search it? Anyway, as he started to go in, some dog attacked one of his men. This is his very first operation, this dog. Well, you've got rabies over there. So one of the other guys, quick as a fucking flash, shot the dog. The bullet passed through the dog, hit the wall. And then the bloke that the dog was attacking, the bullet hit the wall, bounced off, went through his eye into his brain. It dropped like a sack of spuds. That was his very first operation in Afghanistan. It's, it's awful, isn't it? Maybe he should have been doing the statement today. He should have been allowed to do a pre-statement before Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson should have gone, listen, Kim, you know more about it than me. Say what you think about what's going on. Anyway, Boris Johnson just gave a load of shit about how they're going to give him 100 million towards aid. And he says that all our troops are out, uh, but we're going to fully support Afghanistan, uh, the president, blah, blah, blah. He said the Americans is a tactical uh, decision of like, move the troops elsewhere and uh, they're pulling out by September and blah, blah, blah. He didn't say they sneaked out in the middle of the night. Fucking hell. George Bush is there giving a statement telling everybody that we're going to get revenge for 9-11. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then they've bombed the country into the Stone Age or bits of it. But they've also flooded it with money. They've totally distorted Afghanistan. They were flying money into Afghanistan on pallets. Credit notes don't work over there. What you give the banks here. You know what I've been talking about in the last few videos. No, they were flying money into Afghanistan on pallets. Now, 10 years ago, 2008, 2009, I was said the war's already over. But they're still firing. And I explained, America, no, they can't win the war. This is what I was saying in 2008, 2009. I said, they know they can't win the war. And the Taliban had opened an office in Dubai. And what I said was, the Americans are secretly negotiating with the Taliban in Dubai. And it's not about clearing out or whatever. It's about who can keep the money that's been stolen. Because President Karzai, at that time, I did a bit, I explained that President Karzai's brother was stopped as he flew through Dubai Airport. And he had a fucking huge box on his, on his plane. And he was flying to Switzerland, to Geneva. Anyway, Dubai government searched it. Because remember, you've got Sunni and Shi, You've got all this aggression. And they all want to control the wars. And they searched the box on the plane. It had $90 million in it. $90 million in cash. That cash that's flown over from America on pallets. Well, President Karzai's brother had one of them pallets. Might not have had the actual pallet, but he had money that's been on the pallets. And when they asked him, where are you going with that? He said, I'm going to Switzerland. He said, well, what are you doing with it? He said, it's none of your business. Honestly, I could go find you the document, but I just really can't be bothered because I have done it before. I've put this document up before. All you got to do is... Uh, Afghanistan stolen money, Dubai, or President Karzai's brother, $90 million, Dubai. And I was talking about that back in 2008, 2009. And I said, all they're negotiating about is who can keep the money, because they know the Taliban are going to take over the country again. Now, are the Taliban, when they become the legitimate government, are they going to be recognised? And when they are finally recognised, whether it's 10, 15, 20 years down the line, they can officially say, this person stole our money. 
we want him arrested. We want all his assets seized. They can do that once they get control of the country, if they are recognised. It's law. It's like any dictator that steals the money of the country. And also, they wanted to carry on stealing money. They wanted the war to carry on. They wanted to, like, get out with the money they've made. But they also wanted to, to steal more money. And new people wanted to take over. So Karzai, he basically gave the presidency away. The Karzai family fucked off with the money that they've stolen. Hundreds of millions. And a new batch came in to steal what they could in the last days of Afghanistan. Last couple of years. That's what's been going on, stealing the aid money. And Boris Johnson's on about pumping another 100 million in uh, to resist the Taliban. Well, that money's going to go straight on a fucking private jet and it's going to be flown straight out of Afghanistan. He was talking shite. And he was talking as though it's a, a different world. He was talking as though it was something that this guy's never seen. He was talking as though it was like a mission that's going well. And it has been going well. And it's going to go well in the future. And Afghanistan's troops are quite capable of like looking after it. Well, if you go watch the videos on the links I give you, you had the once he'd found out in the morning, there was a news camera there at Bagram Air Base. And it came to an Afghanistan checkpoint by just two bits of concrete on the road. Nowhere else, miles away from Bagram Air Base, which is like one of the outer perimeters. And these two young Afghan soldiers look fucking terrified. Because they've been told the Americans have gone. So there'll be no Apache helicopters. And they also know that the Taliban are going to come in close. You know, give it, give Bagram Air Base a bit of an air, but air, a bear hug. But towns are already falling. Afghan troops are fucking, Afghan troops to get in the goodwill of the Taliban are giving them the weapons, they're giving them the tanks, they're giving them the fucking armoured vehicles. Which is what they did in Syria. John McCain was asked at a congressional hearing, how much money have you put into training this Syrian rebel army? Because they set up a rebel army. And they were training it. He said, uh, $500 million. All oh, right. And the commission, and on this, one of the congressmen asked him the question, how many troops have you actually got? Well, we, we, we had quite a few, you know, five, six, seven hundred, but uh, a lot of them deserted. Well, how many have you got? How many troops have you got for that five hundred million dollars? He said 50. 50 fucking soldiers for five hundred million dollars. And all the weapons have been stolen and sold to the uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS. Couldn't make it up, could you? But the Afghan soldiers now. So what you're going to get now in Afghanistan is warlords. It's going to go back to the old days of warlords. Warlords fighting the Taliban so that they can continue growing opium, heroin, like they did before the Americans came in. Before the Americans came in and built brand new roads so that heroin could be moved around faster, more smoothly. You're going to see, we are going to see more Afghans coming across that channel in the next six months. You won't fucking believe what's going to happen. Coming through the borders into Sweden, into Germany. There's going to be a mass exodus of people with their money. People who've managed to make a, either a handful of money or a fucking car boot of money or a big box that needs to go on an aeroplane all these people are going to be fucking zooming out of Afghanistan in the next few months. And you're going to have these young men who haven't got jobs, who just get paid this, these American dollars that are, in one day will be worth fuck all. The future of Afghanistan rests on them. How many days they can keep it? How many days they can delay it? Because they're waiting for Boris Johnson's £100 million pound now. Somebody will be hanging on to that for the last fucking minute to steal that. So what does Angela Rayner, the Deputy Labour, she's like the Deputy Labour leader, so she gets up and gives a reply to Boris Johnson because 
kiss down as he's away on business. So this, and I'm sorry, ladies. I am fucking so sorry that I have to say this about Angela Rayner. What a fucking example. What a prime example of a stupid, ignorant, northern woman who knows fuck all except politics and how to whinge. What a fucking stupid, moronic bint. And she gets up, she starts talking about women's rights. Can the Prime Minister assure us, the House, that like... We're going to continue to fight for women's rights and also the uh, education of young girls. Now, I told you this fucking three months ago. I told you three months ago that the left and Labour left, the women, are starting to set up the argument to stay in Afghanistan. And it's, it's not got anything to do with terrorism. It's about educating young girls and people like... Kim have to go and the left the feminist I, I told you three four months ago they're starting to create the discussion the argument that the army have to stay in Afghanistan for the rights of young girls young future feminists because they want a feminist society in Afghanistan just like here and you'll see news now in the next few months you're seeing it already with some of the videos i'll give you where they're starting to highlight young girls and how they're going to lose their education when the taliban take up because they're going to shut the schools and the girls are going behind veils they're going to start having to wear burqas that's what's going to happen in the next few months you're going to see it i i was going to say to you i'll give it the end of the month and then it's gone but it won't be that it'll be two months a lot of it will have gone and then there'll just be a little area around Kabul as the old out while the last of the money's been stolen and the last of the American soldiers are there and you're going to see I think we're actually going to see another example of Saigon where the American embassy has to bail out. Remember how they were bailed out in helicopters landing on the roof? And then they actually forgot some of the Marines. All the helicopters had made their way back to the air aircraft carriers and they, some of the Marines were still downstairs. So when they got upstairs expecting the last helicopter to be there, the last helicopter had already left. And the Viet Cong were marching into fucking Saigon. That's what you're going to have in September. So the end date is going to be in September. But I think Afghanistan is going to be lost by the end of the month. But there will still be bits to take. And then it will be Kabul in the last days. Of what the troops are supposed to be there. Because Biden has been and he said. Oh yeah it's September. We're still going to have the odd base and all that. But the biggest fucking military base ever, Bagram Air Base, they sneaked out in the middle of the night. And when you see some of the reports, you see all the machinery. You see the road moving machinery, the air, the runway building machinery. All the computers are still there. All the do all the hospital equipment's still there. Because they had a hospital. All the canteens, everything, it's still there. Everything that was there is still there. It's like when you see those videos of when people go into deserted buildings where people have just left and left the stuff, billionaires. They just walked out and left the fucking Maseratis in the garage. They've left all the furniture in their fucking mansion or their fucking penthouse. Or hospitals. They've just been abandoned and they just walked away from the stuff. It's easy to just walk away, isn't it? That's what the Americans do. So what was it all about? Now I got emotional before looking at my blog radio shows and nearly started crying because I have lots of links to music because I used to play music on my blog radio show. So I used to put a link to the YouTube video of that song 
So I've been listening to the song. So right at the very bottom, I'm going to give you a link to uh, the song. But I'll tell you what I've got. Go watch the very first video. And what it is is, I used this video on one of my blog radio shows in 2010. And I also put a link to this video in one of my playlists. So I found this video within five minutes. And I've always known I was going to talk about this video again. What it is, is the Americans had all different strategies. And one of the strategies was they built bases on the border of Pakistan because the Taliban were coming over from Pakistan. So they built these blocking bases in these valleys that they used. The idea was they were going to like fight the Taliban as he came across. Well, they were fighting the local Afghans as well. And in the end, they couldn't keep it up. This is 2010, this video. And I was talking about it too, that the Americans could not keep these fire bases going on the Pakistan border. It wasn't working. Everything they've done has failed. It was going to fail from the start. That's why God sent me to the Church Universal and Triumphant, because God didn't want these Christians corrupted by the political military aspects of what was coming in the future. God just wanted this Christian church to concentrate on God. Not like Benji Nee and me, but God didn't want Christians to be involved in the political future, the war future of America. And it's the same for Democrats. But this very first video, it's a video of the Taliban. They did the same again. They, these Americans on this base just disappeared in the night. They just vanished. Like they vanished from Bagram Air Base, this giant fucking massive base over like square miles. Well, this small base in the mountains, fire base, they just vanished. They left everything. The Taliban are going in, getting all the stuff. These fucking grenades and fucking bullets because they couldn't carry everything out. They had to come in with just a few helicopters, get the troops and fuck off. They couldn't afford to take the stuff. It was easy to leave the bullets and the fucking bombs. And then the Taliban go in and take the bullets and the bombs. And then them bullets and bombs are used to kill Americans on other fire bases up country. And you think, oh, it's a setup. It's a Taliban setup. It's not. The boxes are all there. It's all neat and tidy, this firebase. The Afghans are all like little kids fucking. We found a load of ice cream. That's the very first video I'm going to give you. And then I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, five videos of what's going on now. And on my, the channels I subscribe to, there's more and more videos coming up about what's going on in Afghanistan. Well, in the next few weeks, YouTube will be overwhelmed with stuff. But will it be up on BBC? What will the government defence minister say? Dominic John uh, Boris Johnson's already talked shag. Angela Rayner, that fucking stupid northern fucking bint, has just said it's that we've got to ensure the rights of young girls in Afghanistan to get an education. Well, it's never been anything to do with us from the start. Tony Blair took us into that war. Tony Blair and fucking Labour. Tony Blair never never went to visit a single soldier in hospital that came back from Afghanistan or Iraq. And Iraq's another fucking situation. But Tony Blair, no Labour government minister all them years ago in 2001, from 2001, all the years Labour in power, no Prime Minister, not Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, none of the Defence Secretaries ever went to the hospital to visit a um, uh, returned wounded soldier, lay on his hospital bed, because Tony Blair never wanted anybody to have a picture of him next to the bed of a soldier with no legs who had been blown to bits in Afghanistan. Tony Blair never ever intended for a, a photograph to exist of him with a wounded soldier. Neither did, he, as far as I remember, Gordon Brown never. And the... In my book, I talk about the Defence Secretary. He had an order. No, that was Iraq, so I'll leave that. So you got them five videos, and they're interesting. 
But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a video. Uh, I'm going to give you a link to my uh, all my blog radio shows at the bottom. And there's one, Dumb America. And I went looking at that and I found some videos on one of my shows. So I'm going to give you a link to two videos from a blog radio show I did back in uh, 2011. And one of the videos is the British Marines fight the Taliban, part one of four. So if you if you watch this one of four, you can go find part two, part three, part four. And this this is December 2006. And you've got these British Marines fighting these uh, Taliban in 2006. And one of them says, he said it's non-stop. I remember him now who's uh, John, what's his name? Tony Blair made that Scotch get. His defence secretary, then he made him minister for Northern Ireland. And when we moved into Hellman province, our defence secretary, the Scotch bastard, who's now a director at Celtic, he said, uh, no, we're going in to build schools and uh, restoration and uh, odds on there won't be a shot fired. And that's what he said days before. British troops went into Elman Province. And you think, well, how can the British troops go into Elman Province? Well, the Americans Elman Province held Elman Province and there was no trouble. When the Americans had it, there was no trouble. It was dead quiet. They flooded it, but they also flooded it with money. They were making money off the Americans. Everybody was making money in Elman Province off the Americans. Plus, the American troops never, ever bothered the heroin trade because if you go to the period where the americans are in Elman before the british troops were in, you see the, the american soldiers going through the fields poppy fields and you see the, the afghan farmers fucking getting the sap out of the poppies well when we went into Elman province you got that scotch gun i don't care if scotch people like uh, no this man was a cunt he was Tony Blair's lapdog. That's why he's now director at Celtic. He's a Vatican boy. Same as Tony Blair. And anyway, so the British troops take over the American bases. And then somebody says, hang on. What are you doing about the heroin? We've got a massive heroin problem back in the UK. And there's British troops walking past heroin farmers taking the sap. So Tony Blair... And John, the fucking cunt, the Vatican boy, he says, uh, oh, right, right, uh, right, we're going to stop the poppy farmers growing heroin. Well, the Americans never stopped that. That's why they had no trouble. As soon as they stopped the heroin, as soon as they started destroying the heroin fields, that's when it kicked off. And that's when British troops started dying. That's why he was defusing 40 IEDs in one day. All because of the heroin trade. And that's what the Taliban are going to be fighting over now with warlords. Warlords are not letting go of the heroin trade. So I've got that video of the Royal Marines. And then I've also got a video of uh, Afghanistan, American raw combat footage, Helmand Province. See, this is Helmand Province, the American soldiers. Because what happened was Obama, because the British troops are fighting for their life and they're underfunded. See, in his book, he met the Labour Defence Secretary. Wasn't the Scotch one, it was the one after him. And they were like, they'd been briefed that how good he was and how many bombs he'd defused. So like, they wanted to have a photograph took with him. And he's there like, and uh, he said, uh, he asked the question of him. He'd just been out and been defusing bombs the day before and he'd been stopped and flown back to meet them because he wanted to have their photographs up with him. And the defense, Labour Defence Secretary said, uh, is there anything you'd want, anything you'd like, you know, uh, you know, dead amiable. So he gave me a long list and top of the list was fucking helicopters. Uh, we need more helicopters, we need more training, we need more men. We, we definitely need more men. We've, we haven't got enough men. We need more bullets we need more grenades we need more this more that we need more fucking anti-tank vehicles the vehicles we've got are no good for ieds we need something stronger uh, we need it and he gave him a big fucking long list 
because Labour never funded that war. Tories never funded that war. But yeah, the Americans were there in Elman province. I did a blog radio show where I talked about this American general. I went and checked. The video's gone. It's amazing how many videos have gone from that period. Not just from Afghanistan, but so many things. You think it's stored forever. It's not. It disappears if it doesn't suit the narrative of certain people. And I had a video of an American general, because Obama, he announced 30,000 that the Americans were going into a, taking Elman province back from the British, because the British were just not handling it. So Obama announced that a surge of 30,000 extra, extra American soldiers were going to Afghanistan to cure the problem in Helmand province. And he made out as though the Americans were taking all of Helmand province, but they weren't. All the English, all the British soldiers in Helmand province who were holding the whole of Helmand province with the Danes, with the uh, Estonians, with the Poles and others, they all got squashed up into a part of Helman province. They were still in Helman province, the British, when the Americans took over. And then the Americans took over the rest with all these 30,000. And they were fighting for every fucking day, just like the British. Whereas when they had Helman province before, it was all quiet because they were flooding Helman province with money. But because the Labour government, the Defence Secretary and the British press said, what about the heroin? It all kicked off and it never stopped. Because we tried to stop the heroin. Never get in, the, in between the heroin dealer and his. Never get in between the heroin producer and the smackhead on the streets of fucking Liverpool or Manchester or Birmingham or London. You in the I told you about a mate of mine who used to do business and he was in that warehouse in Birmingham with him gangsters from all over the country and he was there for his share of the delivery from Colombia when the, when the fucking gates opened at the warehouse this lorry drove in it drove all the way from Southampton from Tilbury or whatever from the fucking docks and it was escorted in by two police fucking outriders told you Bush family Clinton family all back. they're all involved in the drug trade the CIA so I've got them two videos and then I've got three videos of music videos what I came across from years ago and th these videos and other stuff and all the stuff I was talking about and I was reminiscing and I got upset listening to the music and it was nearly in tears but at the end of the day got that very first video where the Americans where they, they pulled out of their bases on the border of Pakistan well they've done it now with Bagram they've sneaked out in the middle of the night so I asked the question again. Kim Hughes, George Cross, painting the sand. What was it all about? 